This is Expat Experts. Welcome to this episode of Expat Experts. Um, today, actually, we're recording from Berlin. Uh, with two guests. <laughs> uh, one will talk, the other will be very probably rude. also at <laughs> some point. Um, yeah, actually, we're recording with Parimal here, already known in the podcast, actually, like uh, from when it was called uh, The Auslander, um, born in Nepal, grown. Yeah up in France, studied in USA, currently living in Berlin. I think we covered the majority of that in the, in the, that, previous, yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. previous episode. Um, UX, UI designer, open project, uh, writer, a uh, little bit of man of renaissance, let's say like this, no? Oh, you know? I'll, I'll, I'll gladly take it. <laughs> you study languages as hobby, you do music, you ride bikes, uh, you have aviation, science, small web, data privacy, uh, a lot of stuff going around, I suppose. Yeah, a lack of focus, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> also, I know about that. Um, and then cuisine, which is probably what we will talk later in, in today's episode. Um, but yeah, um, for all of the people uh, who are listening to us, uh, just please remember to follow us into, onto our social media, Instagrams, um, uh, TikToks, uh, YouTubes, whatever it, that comes, especially in Spotify and YouTube, uh, follow uh, the channel because that helps. And of course, um, it's the only way of listening and viewing actually from now on also in, in Spotify uh, as they introduce this option to, to upload video in Spotify also oh. directly. So you can see the episodes, not only listen to them. Um, but yeah, uh, let's go for it. Let's go for it. Let's start. The Expat, episode one with Parmal Satyal. So just before starting, I would just recommend to everyone who is listening to this episode that maybe goes to the episode number 10 of number what 10, it was yes. used to be the Auslander, which yes. was the first episode that we recorded together. We did. And actually in there we covered everything until arriving here in Berlin. Right. Yes. That's the pre-Berlin yeah. show. So yeah. we talk about you, uh, of course, being born in Nepal, but then growing up in France, studying in, in, in the United US. States, yeah. Um, at some point deciding to move here, but actually at the very point of time, that was pretty recent, the move to Berlin. Yeah, I suppose it had been, um, I don't remember exactly when we did it, but a couple of months after, I think. Mm. It was fairly okay. recent. Yeah, I, I didn't know very much about Berlin uh, as someone who had lived there at the time. Yeah. And now it's already nearly, oh, more than three years, actually. No? Yeah, over three years. Um, has, oh, cheers. Cheers. It's a nice Bordeaux from 2019. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I moved in, I suppose, in April. Um, mm. So it's almost three years, rather. Okay. Um, and it's been uh, quite a ride in the sense of a lot of it is, is exactly what I expected. And uh, some of it is definitely not what I expected. Okay. And, I, and I imagine that will go into definitely. that in a bit, yeah. <laughs> We will definitely go into it um, in that sense, like the city didn't match the expectations that you had, at least not completely as far as I understand, or you were, ex because at the end you came here yeah. for, not for pleasure hundred percent, but you, you came here because you, like me, we work from home at the yeah. end or remotely. So we had the opportunity to, to or have this flexibility in, in, in our side and indeed you didn't came here because you needed to come to no, Berlin. No, no. Yeah, you're right. I didn't need to come to Berlin. Um, I had two main reasons to come to Berlin. So the first one um, would be, well, was to learn German or I already spoke some German. It would be to improve my German. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go to Germany to improve your German, I think any other city would probably be better than, than Berlin, Berlin yeah. for that, yeah. Um, but I mean, I did make some progress. That's mm. obviously there. Um, the second reason was because uh, I've lived in pa I had lived in Paris for so long that I was afraid that if I don't um, move somewhere, 
if I don't even try to move somewhere, that mm. I will always regret not moving and that I will just sort of be stuck in a city. Okay. It'll be by default and not a choice. Um, and, and Berlin was the obvious choice because my friends, a lot of my friends, including my friends from uh, France, were, were and are in Berlin, in, including in, uh, in, this, in this land. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But one of the things that you were talking about and what's probably the main reason was language. Yeah. In a city where clearly it's losing its German more and more progressively, especially in the center of the city. Yeah. I mean, as soon as you go a little bit out of what we will call like the most posh or uh, hipster areas of, of the city, um, you can start listening more and more German there. But at the end, if you go to any bar and any restaurant or any service, uh, it's yeah. English what you hear the most. Yeah, I mean, the, it's, it's, it's funny because um, there, there's almost two parallel worlds in Berlin. You can, if you want to, live in a completely English world. I don't want that, so I try to stay away from that. Mm. However, imagine if you're a group of friends and you're all sort of international. If there's one person who doesn't speak German, then um, because people can speak, uh, generally people can speak, um, English, or at least uh, the people around me, hmm. we tend to gravitate towards the, the most common, optimal language, or the hmm. most optimal common language, as, which is English. There's that, that but that's at a, a sort of personal level with, with your between uh, friends. And then there's the, the, the other side that you mentioned, that you go to a bar or a restaurant, and it's all, already happened to me that I order in German, and say, yeah, actually, definitely have was haben oder sowas. And the person says, uh, do you mind? I don't. You know, do you mind speaking in Ge uh, in English? I don't speak German. Mm. So, uh, but that's one world, and there's the other world, which is more sort of people who are German, who are from Berlin, uh, and there in certain areas you can still hear the Berlin dialect. Um, it, it's not that common, but you can, and um, and I'm always happy to find out, sort of seek out those those areas, and and in those areas you have to speak German, which which is brilliant. Yeah. But it's how it is in a lot of other cities in, 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 in Germany. I assume that at the end you you even like learn the, the, the dialect of that region and not the like the academical yeah. German at the yeah. end. As you know. did in Hessen. <laughs> More or less, More yes. Less. Uh, Frankfurt is one of these other cities that if you want, you can also live you know. in, a, in an English world. Of like course, a bubble, it's yeah. yeah. Like a, it's, but it's what you say. It's literally a bubble of like certain people and if you want you can live whole your life of course in that and then rely on the friends who speak german to call for whatever you need if you need something that they don't speak uh, yeah the, the, the administration the tax administration office. yeah that's, that's <laughs> the biggest one yeah. that's the classic one yeah um well with that said at the end like we were talking already a little bit of areas of the city what it's from now, like from these yeah, years yeah, yeah. of experience, your favorite part of Berlin? Oh yeah, that's, that's a very tough question because um, as your listeners and your viewers now uh, might know there's a lot of the different areas of Berlin have their own charm or their own sort of um, personality. Yeah. I would argue that I like where we are in Friedrichshain. Well, I would, we're in Friedrichshain, uh, sort of not in, uh, right near Prenzlau, uh, Prenzlauberg. Um, it's calm, um, it's residential, you have lovely wine bars, which is a very important uh, detail for me. Um, but then if you go to other places, um, like if you go to Mitte, I always avoided Mitte because I had this image that it's a very sort of touristy area. There's, but there also you've got some lovely restaurants and lovely bars. Mm. You're starting to see a theme here. Um, but my favorite area would actually, um, I would argue, not be an area at all. What, uh, which is a very unfair way to answer the question, but I'll do it anyway, sure. which is um, if you like cycling, it's very easy to go out of the city and have access to sort of Brandenburg, the, 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 the region next to Berlin or surrounding Berlin, very, very quickly. So you can go even, for example, to Poland on your bike very, very easily. Uh, and that, that ability to be in nature so quickly with infrastructure that I would argue is very well developed mm. is probably my favorite place uh, in Berlin. Yeah. I see. Yeah, at the end here it mixes now and it shows a little bit that your hobbies actually fit more or less yeah. in this city. 
but at the same time, you are saying that some expectations were not met in here. Like, what what is the negative part of, of, of ah, how a... are you seeing here? Yeah, I, I suppose um, I I wouldn't quite say the expectations weren't met. I would say that um, I I didn't have very clear expectations. Mm. So um, I mean, you can find everything in Berlin. You can find uh, any niche, any sort of interest uh, is. Um, has its place in a city like Berlin. I suppose for me, um, that what I am not a big fan of um, is the fact that I, I, it, it relates to what we're going to talk about later, which is the food culture. You can find amazing food in Berlin, um, and there's great street food. I, if, if I had to sort of pick different types of food, uh, we go from home cooking, uh, and then you go to uh, street food. This food you make, um, like a medium, like normal restaurant, mm. and then gastronomy, right? Like the very gastronomic restaurants. I think Berlin does the the gastro gastronomy, uh, the gastronomic rest restaurants, and the street food exceedingly well. Okay. But that middle ground, which is just a normal restaurants, right? Um, they're, in my opinion, a little too expensive, and also the culture around food is not. But that's more to do with, I think, uh, how cosmopolitan Berlin is. Uh, mm. And I find it less uh, exciting. Uh, the sort of the food and wine scene is, is definitely there. You can find amazing things. But culturally, I think that people are a lot less excited about food. And I, so that's one. Uh, and the winters uh, are, are, can, can be a bit harsh. A little bit, yeah. Probably it's the length also, no? I mean, it's yeah. a part of, like, I think the last episode we talked about a little bit, like, this downside of or i talk with a lot of people who lived here in berlin or in germany and it's if you have like one or two months of harsh winter you survive but if you have six months yeah, 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 yeah. it starts to become like hardcore on your mental health especially a lot of people who are saying yeah indeed. lack of sun um, lack of sun yes so was, would that be the, the part that you miss from France? Or if, if you could take something from Paris and bring it here, would, oh. be, would it be the weather? Not really. Um, because it's not the, the it's most not. exciting thing in the world in Paris either. Not no, no, like. no, no, no. It's not, it's, it, would, it would certainly not be the weather. Um, no, like, for example, this last winter was brilliant. I, I loved it. We had snow, which I really like. Uh, we never, it was never too harsh. Mm -hmm. um, the reasons why um for which the weather were uh, well, the weather was so good perhaps are not particularly positive no. uh, not to be celebrated <laughs> nevertheless the truth is it, it, it wasn't that bad so so it wasn't a problem at all um the the city you know i mean it's it's a city that's very sort of wide it's very large uh, just in area mm. um so it means that the whole city is very um it's not very dense which means that you can if you're already not feeling great uh struggle to sort of uh it i mean th th there's a lot of gray there's a lot of gray and, and you can feel a bit overwhelmed by that uh i don't think that's uh, that's the biggest thing though the the biggest thing i would bring from france to germany uh to berlin and, uh, because would be the cheese with the oh gosh no you know you can find really good yeah. french cheese uh, as well uh but um yeah but cheese wouldn't be that far away but it would be just the excitement uh i would just say the excitement not like an event, but just the general excitement of living. Like things like um, great conversation, mm. uh, the sort of um, a little the, the being the a bit gray alien. mood, no? This like a yeah, it's, yeah, it's a thing of, of here, like ways of talking about things. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's curious because it's a city that has thousands of activities. Like it's one of these cities that if you want to do something, there is always something to There's do in always, Berlin. Yeah. But then when you talk with people, especially people from here, from Berlin, yeah. born here and raised here, it's, it's of course like making a majority yeah. out of nowhere, but it's not, it's not the reality for everyone. But I, I met a lot of people who is, are kind of like dark or like not dark in the sense of, of, of being like a, dressing in dark, which also, which a lot also of, is but, very but much a black thing. Yeah. But like this mood of like, I don't know. I'm of, of, maybe they are ha they are super happy with their life here, but they don't show it. You know? Yeah, like yeah. It's uh, no, you're right. It's that it's it's a lot. I mean, um, it's 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 a feature also of Berlin. I think it's something that's quite positive. Is 
if you're someone who doesn't like being bothered, who doesn't like sort of making a lot of conversation, if you're not very social as a, as you're not a very social creature, um, well, Berlin is very comfortable because no one generally bothers you on the streets mm. or your interactions uh, at the supermarket. Uh, I was going to say at the bank, but who who goes to the bank these days? But yeah. at well, <laughs> but but um, and Greeks a lot. And Greeks, <laughs> you'd know about that. Yeah. Um, so you you can sort of have your own space, which is also I, I do enjoy that a fair bit. Yeah. But I will say that um, there's nothing really I dislike about Berlin. I think the reason I'm considering moving back to France next year, okay. moving back to Paris, and we'll probably get to that as well, yeah, is because um, is because I I miss France for me. Uh, I miss the excitement uh, around sort of how animated things are, how animated conversations are, how mm. I, I, and also a bit of, oh gosh, I, I was about to say I, I like some of the negativity there, <laughs> but that sounds really, I don't mean that. What I mean is I like that it's a bit, um, there's a bit of everything. You know, it, it's a bit more expressive yeah. uh, and not just necessarily Artistic. people. Yeah, the mood is more expressive mm. and uh, yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean, I, I, I don't necessarily think that's better. I think it fits me better. Mm. Um, but certainly uh, Berlin, so in that sense, what I, I, that's why I would say it, it's not like my expectations were met. I wasn't entirely certain and I'm glad I came. And I know that when I leave, I will miss Berlin a lot, especially the cycling. Makes yeah. sense. Um, in that thing at the end, you're just saying that probably you're planning to, to go back to France and at some point. I mean, yeah. Do you think it's also related with the idea that you grow up there and, and maybe you are so used to the ways of doing of, of a place? The fact, like the, the, the very beginning of the episode, you were saying that you were moving here because of the of the fear of like yeah, only yeah. being in one place and then suddenly, oh fuck, I realized that I never moved or I'd always been here for the comfort, which is okay. A yeah. lot of people does that at the end. Do you think that you are actually going back due to the, the, the same fact in the sense of like, I know that and I, I mean, at least now you have the, the comparison, no? Exactly. Uh, it's, it's, if I, I mean, it had always been my goal to live in Berlin for a while. Uh, when I say always, I, before moving here, I spoke about it for, for five years. My, my friends were all sick of it. Genuinely, they were like, either just do it already or stop talking about Berlin. So in some ways I had to do it at that point, yeah. you know, and if I didn't do it, uh, because around the time I moved, I was very, very comfortable in Paris. Uh, and of course, um, our jobs, uh, do they know that we, we are colleagues? We're colleagues. If not, now they know. Now they know. Yeah, we're colleagues. So where we work, it's a remote company. So I could have worked from Paris as well. Mm. Um, but I decided to do it um, because I wanted it. And I'm glad I did. But it was never meant to be uh, a one-time move. I, sorry. Hello. Yeah, um, allergic to Catalans. We will, we will reduce this. <laughs> <laughs> nice waste. You'll we'll probably have to bring the levels down. No, sorry, yes. Um, I was saying that, yeah, it's not necessarily a one-way move. It's, uh, it never is for me. Even when I go back to Paris, mm. I might say, oh, perhaps, uh, you know, I, in my, one of my goals is to live in Italy for about six months to make sure that I learn how to make pasta properly and uh, improve my language skills. Or in Denmark, uh, also for the language skills. That's uh, what I was asking, like at the end, you're considering going back home, what you consider home at the end. Exactly. And it, it was there the idea of like maybe do, doing a step in between that uh, as a more definitive move, or it's just like, okay, you want to establish Paris as a base to be there and then what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's exactly it. Um, it's, um, I don't preclude the possibility that I might live somewhere else for a bit, but I want my base to be, my home to be. Uh, so if Paris. you move to, I don't know, Denmark, Copenhagen or yeah. like north of Italy or Italy, it would be yeah. more the idea of like going there for, from time to time, couple of yeah, months, exactly. do something there, uh, preserve your apartment probably yeah, well, in Paris and then... Uh, that's great. But if I, if I can, that's brilliant what, what you just said, because you were like, oh, if you go to Denmark or the north of Italy or Italy. <laughs> so clearly it's uh, two different countries. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as you know, we are also taking the look at uh, moving to, to exactly. Italy. And I mean, now being in Athens, for example, like for us going to South Italy, yeah, the difference for being in Athens and, and being... In Napoli, 
yes, food, probably, yeah. language, of course, and different ways of being, but, but it's at the same distance from home. Uh, we, we don't win the, the proximity to families, no, you for don't. example, or what we call home, no, which is at right. the end what, what, what you are trying to do, which is like uh, establishing a place that you call fixed home and then like moving around a little bit more flexible, but having a base. Yeah, correct. I think, I think that, would, that would be fair. Nice. So one of ten. How, how much do you miss France? Oh gosh, you see, you, you asked me at the wrong time because I was just there yesterday. Yeah, uh, I, I, true. yeah I got back yesterday. So, so at this particular moment, not, not a whole lot because um, you know, there's always, it's like battery, right? Like it, it gets mm. it de like it discharged and, and I've got to go back and have my, have my sort of recharge of, of France and I come back here and, and that then allows me to enjoy Berlin even, even more. So at this particular moment, not a whole lot, but in general, I would, I would put it at, um, you know, I, I think what to be fair to Berlin, I would say on average, I, I miss France. When I first got here, the first year, it was probably like, uh, after the initial honeymoon, honeymoon mm -hmm. period, probably like six or seven out of 10. Now I'll say four or five, um, because I do go back every once in a while. But if I've not been there for a while, then yeah, I miss it a fair bit. Yeah. Makes sense. Food, restaurant and friends. In that <laughs> order. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> friends last. <laughs> um, what about Nepal at the end? Like as a um, homemade, yes. like I know that uh, your parents... My parents are in Nepal, yeah. Nepal, back to Nepal. Back to Nepal from Australia. Not, You're right, for, yeah. Um, for some time. So... That never entered the equation. I, I assume, like going back to Nepal as a as a time thing or as a very. That's a good. That's a great question. Um, that's a great question that uh, my mother will be very happy that you asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know it's um, so. My parents were not there either. Uh, the earlier, or oh, when we report when mm -hmm. we record the last episode, they were with my brother in Australia. So my brother's in Australia. So now we are family in three continents. Um, which is, you know, which is interesting. Um, and so what I, so my relationship to Nepal is, is, is very interesting. We, we spoke about it in my first, mm. in the first episode, episode 10, I believe, of the, Ausland, uh, the Auslander. Um, and the thing is, it's, uh, so when my parents were not there at all, there were, you know, I've got family there that I miss, um, uncles and cousins and, mm. and, and such, uh, mostly cousins, mostly cousins. Uh, I was going to say, oh, there isn't a particular uncle I miss at all, but I think that'd be a bit rude um, to the many uncles who might be, or might not, might not be listening. I'm just digging myself into a hole. I'll get out of that. So anyway, so um, now you're going to go back to <laughs> <I'm> gonna, <laughs> now. I'm banned. Um, no, so but now that my family is there, um, and I, I was there last year, I I think it takes a while to sort of rediscover the place that you were born, and you know, it's I it I'm. There is a lot of Nepali in me, obviously. I, I, I spent the first 18 years of my life there. Uh, and so the, the goal now is to try to go back at least once a year. Um, you know, uh, apart from the pandemic, we uh, used to see each other at least once a year anyway, but that was not necessarily in Nepal. So now um, I want to do that. And also, also relevant to the second part of the, the podcast, I um, am starting to discover sort of food cultures in Nepal that I was completely unaware of because I was raised in a particular sort of part of the city in a particular type of family. So like anywhere you're exposed to only maybe 2% of uh, the actual culinary um, spectrum that might exist in the country. And so now I'm getting interested and the, <laughs> the irony of the, of the thing is um, I've been watching this. Uh, this is a f completely free um plug uh, for someone's youtube there's a guy called uh Tongi. he's a french guy mm -hmm. and he speaks nepalese uh, nepali sorry uh he speaks nepali and he goes around nepal and tries to discover the te terroir so local food from different regions and, and I'm, I'm watching these videos i'm thinking gosh i've not tried most, most of these of things yeah. so i want to do that so it's a french guy who's introducing me to nepalese cuisine nice. uh, through youtube uh, and my brother is is i think a little more connected to that these days so through him and through ch channels like that 
uh, I want to sort of rediscover and perhaps um, uh, rebuild that bridge to Nepal. Mm. Yeah, so that's definitely something I want to do um, soon. But yes. as you know, I'm, I say as you know, I'm someone who really is focused on things that are around me physically. I have mm. trouble thinking uh, of things that are physically far away. And that, that's also one of the, the reasons I want to go back physically every year. And that'll allow me to sort of be there, both physically and mentally. Nice. Yeah. So maybe before just jumping to, to the second part, um, I want just to propose a little this or that, let's say like Oh, this. hello. Um, if you need to choose, like there is no option, you need to choose one option or the other. Right. Like, it's a uh, someone it's pointing you yeah so you with a gun and like a uh, or b or exactly. else i have to live in germany forever right so exactly like okay. <laughs> full hipster berlin oh gosh full techno berlin oh that's the question full hipster berlin or full techno berlin i thought these questions were going to be easy i'll go for full you know what techno berlin hmm? yeah techno okay yeah 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 i <laughs> That's a uh, that's a funny one. Okay, <laughs> parks inside of the city yeah. or leaving the city? Oh, leaving the city, exiting like yeah, like I I want to be able to go uh, out and I, that's what I like doing. Yeah. Okay, nice. I mean I still want parks in the city, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting thing because at the end like a lot of like people who lived in Berlin says this kind of dichotomy of this city. You know, it's a great city architecturally wise especially yeah but then suddenly if they compare it to other big cities of europe it has a lot of parts oh you know i if so in defense of berlin which is still a city i love um it's extremely green and the number of lakes you have around but the city you just hear this sentence like it's extremely green next to it's extremely gray you're right which, yeah, is, yeah, 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 yeah. which is really funny because it's like you're putting right. the two opposites like i understand and what in the winter means. it's not green yeah. No, and when you come here, even if you come in winter at the end, like the parks are still absolutely right. green if it's not snowed. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're right. That's an interesting. Yeah, that's a very good point. I understand. You need to be here to understand that the architecture it's brutal. It's yeah. Certain, especially certain certain parts of the city, it's even more brutal. Yeah, yeah. It can be, get very dirty very quick. This city, let's say, like yeah. this also. Yeah. But that suddenly you go to I don't know Treptow Park and you have kilometers of park to walk yeah no without any problem it's this is amazing and also um again in defense of berlin the historical sort of significance of the city mm. uh i mean i'm i'm very interested in espionage well that's an odd thing to say i'm interested in the history of espionage this is still a very berlin was at the crossroads of so many cultures mm. and so many sort of significant events events in, in in world history european history but also the world history so um the remnants of that are still present and for example you can still see a, a very strong um divisions, divisions between the east and the west yeah and i find that fascinating but beyond that uh, like i said earlier you can ride you can wake up in the morning take your bike bicycle ride have lunch in poland and come back to berlin and have dinner in berlin um, this is possible even today, right? Like you can do it quite easily. So we're very much in, in central, I would argue that Berlin is a central European city, not a Western European city. Um, because, you know, it, we're not, in terms of the um, latitude, we're not that far from, um, from um, longitude, sorry, not latitude, from, from Austria. Mm. Uh, sorry, in Vienna, sorry, uh, and, 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 and Prague. I, I don't don't take my word on that. Do check a map because I am not very strong in geography. When someone looks at a map, and what, what on earth is he talking about? <laughs> but you get what I'm trying to say. I, I don't know if there is a lot of people <laughs> in geography <laughs> listening to my podcast. But All right. If they are, no problem. They no will. They will they come. Will no, no problem. Yes. Um, okay. Next question. And the, I have two more. Go on then. One might be putting you in conflict with the German people, whatever oh, you yeah, respond. Yeah, that's fine. And the second one probably will put you either with the German or the French. So the first one, it's Berlin beer or beer from anywhere outside of Berlin. Oh, uh, anywhere outside of Berlin. It's obvious. No, there is people who are very strong opinions about, Berlin, about beer. beer Berlin. 
No, I mean, the south of Germany, Belgium, uh, or um, I also like the beer scene in uh, Denmark. Mm. Um, but, but certainly not Berlin beer, no. It's not no. water easy. No, it's just not very uh, interesting. I mean, Germany is brilliant for beer, but it's mostly all from the south. Isn't yeah. it? Right. Okay, the last question Go for this section. German bread or French bread? Ah, French bread. Yes. No, not even a, not even a, not even a yeah, competition. Like, yeah. Nah, very easy. I mean, I know it's supposed to be better. No, okay. To be fair to Germany, there's the variety is is brilliant, and there's a lot of like interesting um, grains. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, it, I'm a creature of habits. I like, you know, when I go to the boulangerie, uh, and we're gonna, we're not going to talk about sort of all the, the croissant and the pain chocolat, all that. That's that's different. No, no I'm, I'm talking about bread. pure bread, yeah. like. Uh, but I'm not plaster is the thing. Yeah. Exactly, not of that, yeah. In that case, um, I I want, all I need, right, me personally, is um, uh, une, uh, une baguette tradi uh, traditionnelle, enfin, yeah. une tradition, or uh, une baguette uh, classique, you know, just like a... Classical baguette. Yeah, or, or the tradition. Uh, that, I, I, be, beyond that, there are also interesting things in France, but I very rarely get anything else. So, a lack of imagination, perhaps, but I'm very, very um, simple. And I like white bread. No, it's yeah. all right. I mean, I've, and I, in here in Germany, they are very famous to doing other kinds of bread. Other like kinds black of bread. breads, uh, grains uh, with varieties, a little bit more like toasted stuff and a little bit more different. If you're a classic person who you want like baguette uh, in, a in a classic white bread, let's say like this, Certainly, of course, yeah. you will go for the French one. Yeah, and also, you know, it's it might be healthier, right? But I would also put it to you that drinking water is healthier than drinking wine. And here we are, the reason we drink the wine. Yes, that's also true. But yeah, now that we are talking about food, maybe we can directly jump to the, I to the second part. Yeah, if you yeah, like. yeah. Well, let's do it. Let's do it. Sure. Perhaps a cheers? Sure. There we go. Let's go. The expert building a cuisine repertoire. Let's start. With the second part, everyone who follows Parimal in social media knows that her his stories are literally a 90% cooking, 10% <laughs> cats. And by cats, I mean Carl. Um, this one. Only this, <laughs> normally. Um, so I proposed which, uh, which uh, topic you wanted to discuss. And uh, of course, like, I let that to the guests, and at the end, you you are cooking a lot. Like yeah. you cook a lot at home, but you also like, as we could see in the first part of the episode, one of the main reasons for you like to like one place or the other. It's the quality of the restaurant, it's the quality of, of the um, I don't know the wine bars, the yeah. places where you can go out and, and have a good meal. Um, where does the cooking part comes from? Like. When did you start cooking? Well, that's yeah. Um, I don't remember a start because, uh, and I think it's a family thing. For for many people, it is that. And um, I've got a family who loves being in the kitchen. Um, so, in my family, we've got like two different cultures. So my mum's side of the family um, were. They're very specific about how they cook food. It's mm. a very traditional approach, but not traditional sort of uh, traditional Nepalese. It's traditional to her family. Mm -hmm. So that was there from the, I was very young. My dad is, uh, he likes imp improvising. He likes experimenting. Um, but we always sort of have loved food. We've mm. always cooked a lot as a family. Um, and often when we have like a dinner, I wouldn't say we argue um, to decide who cooks. But it's sort of almost like you want to be the one making food. So I think from a very young age, I, I think it came from my parents. And then when, you know, as you move to different areas of the world, as you grow up, you start developing sort of a, a taste for, haha, <laughs> taste for, a taste for the, for, for the, for the food cultures, mm. not only because of the flavors, but for what food represents socially and the importance that food has for uh, people and, and, people's sense of culture, people's sense of identity. Mm. Um, so I'm very drawn to that. And so I don't, whilst I don't know when it started, uh, I do know why it's there. Okay. Yeah. 
so it comes from family but at the end you cook a, a lot of french recipes <laughs> generically no because at least what i've seen is that you have a very established like recipe book or whatever yeah, you have yeah. in your mind uh french wise do you still cook any nepalese food yeah um, no i mean you said that you are starting to discover like some youtubers and whatever now so yeah are you also like trying to get to, yeah. to cook that yeah okay um good question um so right now my i love you know so pianists people who play the piano use the word uh, repert repertoire or uh, mm. repertoire in, in english and the repertoire is the are, the are the pieces that they that they play that they're comfortable playing so you can say all right uh, you know um greeks uh, concerto in a minor is in my uh, repertoire or not and i am building my repertoire as chef is a big word but um someone who likes to a like, hobbyist chef mm. uh, and the dishes that I'm working on right now are Italian and French. I love traditional French uh, cuisine. And uh, when you asked me how much, how much you miss France, on a scale of one to 10, my mind was eventually, uh, immediately going to French. how much, do I, yeah, French food yeah. Uh, and, and French brasserie and all that. So in terms of cooking, uh, I am mostly working on that because that's my culture. That's the culture that I didn't get from my family. I got the love of cooking for my family mm -hmm. and the, the love of eating together with my, for my family. My love for French cuisine or Italian cuisine is my own thing. I, I, I um, also, I think, I don't know if we've talked about it in my last episode, in the last episode um, in which I was a guest, but um, I became French in 2019. So I, I became yes, a French sorry. national. Yeah, I think I mentioned that. Uh, and that also somehow, uh, you know, some people say, oh, it's only a technical thing. No, not for me. It was a very important part of my life. And I sort of uh, had this intense desire to really um, be more in touch with this, this country that, uh, that is now my home and is, 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 is my, in my only country. I, I, I'm, I'm only a citizen of, of France. And so I, I went, found this rab rabbit hole, this wonderful rabbit hole. You know, often when you say that, you know, you, you, you're trying to dig yourself out. No, I'm quite the opposite. I'm a rabbit. Who, that's a weird sentence. I'm a rabbit who's trying to dig deeper holes. And cooking uh, the rabbit at the same yeah, time. Yeah, cooking, and cooking the rabbit at the same time. Oh, delicious with the oven, with a bit of herbe de Provence and a bit of olive oil and nothing else. Brilliant. Um, so now yes. Now half of the listeners of the podcast who are not Mediterranean are leaving the podcast because <laughs> who the fuck cooks rabbits? Oh, <laughs> I didn't realize that was a. I didn't realize that was a trap. I genuinely now think let's talk about delicious. snails. Yeah, sure. Snails are not that common. They're from Burgundy, the, the classic ones. Um, but are delicious. We, we do them. Yeah. Oh, you okay? You do yeah. okay. So, but to answer your your the second part of your question, which was about Nepalese food. Now this is. I am cooking more Nepalese food, but my goal is very particular right now, which is that there's food from Nepal that I know. Mm. Three categories, right? Food from Nepal that I know, there's food from Nepal that um, I don't know, that I'm willing, uh, I'm, I'm curious about trying. And then there's food that I grew up with. And for some reason, the food that I grew up with, I can't find anywhere else in Nepal apart from um, when my mom cooks it, when my aunt cooks it, so my mom's sister, or when my gra grand aunt cooks it. Because it was a very familial thing. And my and mom- all coming from the part of this family that you said that is more like traditional cooking in that sense, like that they <laughs> follow more like the rules. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not even the rules. What happens is, and, and this, I have to be very careful when I explain this part because, um, because the, I, my knowledge of this area is very limited. So um, a lot of the influences on that side, um, there's the police, there's a bit of Indian, and there's a, quite a fair bit of Persian. Okay. Uh, because they are the, the Shahi family, uh, mm -hmm. and they, um, I, I don't know how much I can talk about this, uh, not because for legal reasons, just because I my no, my knowledge is limited. Yeah, correct. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, it's because that they uh, were related to the uh, royal family back in the day. They were not the royal family, but they were close mm -hmm. around it. And so, 
in that world, there was a lot of very strong Persian influence, and there okay. are some techniques in cooking that um, are not you can't find them. Uh, so it's arriving to a point that it's more like family recipes than traditional Nepalese exactly. food. Exactly, it's no? not so yeah, exactly. At the same time, it's it, I'm asking because it's the, which part of the family it is because it it tends to happen like this, like the part of the families or the families that are following the, the recipe book in a very strict way yeah. tend to have a recipe book. You're right, you're right. The, yeah. the part who is, or the cooks or the chefs who are very creative, yeah. they tend to improvise things and they tend to like, oh, I open the fridge and then I see what it, a little bit what That's I my have. Father. Or That's my father, yeah. I, I'm going more into that direction, although I would really, really love to have something from my grandma, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And luckily, I never met, but, but, um, or my grandpa who died like some years ago, and, and he was cooking fish into an level, another level, like. Yeah. And these recipes, I know that my mom know how to do them, and I learned some of them from my, from both my mom and my grandpa, but. There is some of that that I would have loved that was written down somewhere. Exactly. You know, like, and, and that's something that I miss. I miss uh, absolutely. But that's exactly it. So when part of my repertoire is right now, sort of the things I'm working on, the pieces I'm working on, if I were um, learning to play the piano, which I also am, that's another <laughs> topic. Of course, as a man of Renaissance. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at it yet. Um, is um, so French food, but traditional um, because traditional French food is about techniques. Mm. So escoffier, les sauces, you know, the, the basics, yeah. and then, but also regional food. Uh, I love that uh, uh, because food tells a story. And in some ways, I think I'm not actually interested necessarily in the food. I'm interested in the stories that these food, um, these recipes tell. The second bit is then Italian, but I'm really focusing on pasta. And the third bit is going to be then the familial recipes. From my mom's side mm. because i think if there is no documentation of it properly and if um there is a risk of these recipes just being not lost being lost and uh I'm, i'm you know i i'm fascinated by people who um who are librarians or are interested in our, uh, archiving sort of so, so you are, are you even considering like keeping them like doing some kind of blog out of it or some kind of like absolutely uh, you have in a small web not because it's small the web itself it's yeah. because it's yeah designed in a small web approach for yeah. for everyone who doesn't know what a small web is like the, the, the antithesis of like the making corporate. webs complicated yeah and, and, and the antithesis of the corporate web where there's a there's a financial incentive but you're absolutely right my goal is to try to document these recipes mm -hmm. put it on the web um so and essentially open source all of these recipes um I have no interest, obviously, in keeping it. Uh, it's yes. food. Yeah, yeah. The food is. Uh, I've been criticized, and you know, rightly, for being a bit too conservative sometimes with food, right? But it's, and you know, the anti-fusion guy. That's not entirely true. What I don't like is when um, there's things that are mixed together without an understanding of the why. If the why is there, then I'm fine. So, the Japanese Peruvian approach for the Japanese. Yeah, I, mean, I went yeah. to I went to a restaurant the other like some months ago. Like they were doing Japanese Peruvian cuisine, and of course, from the very extract part, you see like what the fuck, what are they doing? Yeah, that, you exactly. know, like, yeah. It just ended that they are two guys who are married, and one is Peruvian and the other yeah. is Japanese. Okay, whatever. I understand the story behind it, and yeah. that's alright. Yeah. But it's difficult to mix. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's. I mean, if you are working with the techniques, you are working with an understanding of the ingredients, right? Uh, and 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 an understanding of the interplay of of, of these things, uh, then something beautiful can come out of it. Sure. And and uh, one of my oh gosh, this is going to sound so um, pretentious, uh, but as a French person, I do have the right. Uh, <laughs> we already have that. Oh, already, gosh. <laughs> already have that uh, reputation. So. Building stereotypes of French. <laughs> Some of them are not bad. So, so one of my favorite uh, recipes to work on, and and I'm also giving this away uh, because it's not mine to begin with. Is so there's a dish called puli basquets. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's from the southwest, classic with uh, with uh, poivron, uh, poivron uh, peppers, with peppers, peppers. tomato, um, and it's with chicken. Uh, also, usually from the south, uh, and it's a lovely sort of dish that's uh, slightly soupy. 
um, Pimo uh, Desplet. And um, there's, a dish, there's a version of that dish that I create, which is the risotto version of it. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so using the, the, the liquids from uh, the, the soup, rather, the sauce, <laughs> use that as the bouillon, um, the broth, broth. Yeah. thank you, for the risotto. And uh, that allows you to make a poulet, uh, risotto basquez. Mm -hmm. So it's a poulet basquez in risotto form, and then you serve the, the, the chicken uh, on the sides, uh, on, on, on a, when you do the dressage mm -hmm. next to it. So uh, this is sort of, uh, it's, and the pretentious part is for me to call it my signature dish, but it is one of my signature dishes. That's fusion, right? Uh, yeah, but at the same time, like, I don't know eh, if you share this, but at the end, like, I'm a person who likes to try restaurants and go and have, not all the time, of course, you know, I'm not as rich to do that, but I, <laughs> I like to go to this kind of like gastro that you were saying, like not the middle class restaurants, but from time to time going to something that has a Michelin star, for right, example, yeah, or yeah. two Michelin. It doesn't matter, like something that it's there or that I can try because the curiosity. What it has been happening to me for quite some time, it's that there was a set way of doing Michelin right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that there was a lot of restaurants that were really repetitive in what they were doing in that sense and trying and some of them trying techniques that were not for what you are doing so losing the tradition of where you are and, yeah. and, and i'm going to say that from perspective I, I don't know i remember a michelin star in london indian one incredible okay like i've i mean you know the indian from indian food either because you've been in India or because you taste here the, from Indian restaurants, right. which normally they need to reduce the spices. They need to bring it a little bit down because right. of like, if not, people don't buy from them. No, which is sad. Of course it's sad, but it's what it is. They it need is to, is. They, at the end, they adapt to the, to the thing or they don't have the ingredients for, for doing what they would do at home. Yeah, yeah. Being a Michelin star in a place like London, that there is a lot of com Indian community. Yeah. It was an incredible experience, but because it was still traditional in the sense of like they were reinventing Indian cuisine, but they were doing Indian cuisine. Yeah. They were not lost in something that it's not from anywhere. That's that's a big risk, I think, in in um, in cuisine in general. You do you do want to add your touch, you do want to be innovative. Because there's something you want to surprise your your um your, uh, I was going to say viewers, but your guests, yeah. one of you, you want to surprise, you, you want to give them an experience. But it's very, it's the same in music as well. You can get lost in trying to be innovative. Um, and I've also found myself sometimes in that, you know, music trying to do all these things. Then you realize like a four uh, chord song sometimes can elicit pleasure and excitement and joy uh, without needing the complexity. So then you have to go back and ask yourselves, what is that complexity for? Right? And if you can answer that question, and, and the answer can be as simple as, oh, it's fun. That's enough. But you do need to know the why. I understand, but at the end, it's different that you explore and you play around when you are cooking at home and then you're trying things. And most of the things that they do in this kind of restaurants, you cannot do it at home. No, 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 you can't. But yeah. even if you explore mixing things at yeah. home, it's you doing your thing and that's all. You yeah. are not charging anyone 200 euros or oh, no, 150 I think you euros, should, you know, for... You, no, you should be able to do anything at home, you know, and... and exactly, it, but that's that's your playground. That's your playground. To, to, to do whatever you want and then come through the recipe, refined or not refined, or, like, it, it was one of the, also, the questions that I wanted to ask you, because at the end you were talking about, like, for example, having as a reference of your, or of your recipes the French part and yeah. then having the Italian ones, which are the two types of cuisines that are antagonic in, in some kind of ways. The French processes are long, are depurated, are, are perfected, are whatever. While the Italian, it's yeah. the base of Italian cuisine at the end. It's like not for having more ingredients. It means that no. it tastes better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The processes needs to be simple You're absolutely right. and need to be traditional. Yeah. And how how does it fit in your in 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 your mentality? These two, like I love this question. I love this question because I, I like talking about it, and nobody ever asks. <laughs> so, so I am being asked for once, so I'll answer. So let's start with an example. All right, it's it's a cliche. What I'm going to mention, but we're going to talk about 
um, carbonara. Mm-hmm. Right now, carbonara is traditional in a way that that the pad thai is traditional, in which in, it's not very old. The recipe, uh, the carb- uh, yeah, some some people even dated as as early as the Second World War, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, but it is traditional at least in the space that it occupies in people's minds. Now, the carbonara is, is is a Roman pasta. It's very basic in in the ingredients, right? You have spaghetti, bucatini, whatever pasta you're using. You have eggs, you have uh, guanciale, and you have pepper. You don't need anything else. That, that's 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 carbonara. That's the magic of most of Italian recipes. At the that's end, no? the magic. But there is some, and and and, and, I, and I get frustrated because um, and it's a very creamy pasta, right? And so often uh, in France, you know, for example, without the cream, the with the cream. <laughs> And to me, this is sort of this is a typical example, you know, of and people say, well, if I like like it with cream, why can't I have it? Of course, you can have it. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, just but, call it pasta with cream. Pasta with cream. <laughs> I think, and and this is me. So that's my perspective. I'm not necessarily saying it's the it's, it's the it's the correct one, although it is. Uh, it's it's the the so the way to get that creaminess in the Italian approach, right? Is that there's an, a process of emulsification that happens. Between the 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 che- oh I forgot the the, the pecorino completely but um, the the pecorino the the cheese and the pasta water emulsifies and the best way to do it is this there's a process called manticare right so uh, at the end uh, when you are mixing everything well you don't need to do this with uh, I'm using the wrong pasta as an example I should have used Arabi uh, the um, amatriciana but anyway the point is there's a, a gesture. That which is sort of you know buttering um, things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So mantecare, uh, you can you can uh, you can call it a number of others. Uh, there are other words that you can use also for that. But it the point is to um, mix it enough that this emulsification happens and this creamy recipe, uh, creamy texture is there, and that texture is very much part of what makes it enjoyable. Um, and so I guess they they are diametrically opposed because the French approach approaches reduction. Sources, mm. um, more complex preparations. There are there are exceptions, of course. And the Italian approach is five ingredients, sometimes three. But the technique is really, really important. Um, of course, of course. Yeah. I mean, when you you go to Bologna and you you need to to know tortelloni, for example, and, and then they do tortellini a brodo, si. uh, which is with a broth, and and it's as simple as it is, like a tortellini pasta. Like, of course, but the pasta needs to be done in one way. The tortellini, depending on what feeling it has, it needs to be turned in one way or the other to yeah. mark that it's different from the other. Uh, bringing it into a broth of chicken or vegetables, yeah. it's special because it makes the filling soft. These kind of things, I, I, I meant it from a from a very like ingredient perspective. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. At You're the end, right. like Italian cuisine is like let's try to like reiterate on this same recipe with very very few ingredients that we have at hand until we perfect it to a craziness. I I know that France. Does cuisine does that also in that sense, but does it from very different perspectives, Absolutely. like from long boiling times, from long uh, cooking times. While the Italian, it's more like I prepare something and then I cook it five minutes. Yeah, it's um, Gino da Gino da Campo um, said minimum. I'm going to do the accent. Minimum effort, the maximum results. results. And that's often I find the credo of uh, yeah. Let me ask you, um, right? Because you, I mean, your listeners and your viewers know you fairly well now. But do you? Would you agree that? A I lot don't know of, if they know me. Like actually, I interview people all the time, and I'm so, just yeah. like well, they know you, a lot of my guests. But, but maybe they don't know you very well. So this is this is an occasion. So um, you've got a background that is uh, obviously Catalan. There's there's a bit of Italian in you, obviously. A good part of you is Italian. Mm. Um, you've lived in a number of different uh, regions, including Germany. Yes. So, would you agree, disagree, or have a third opinion that a lot of great food comes from poverty? Of course. I mean, people needs to eat, and the recipes that are the most crazy comes from times of need. And that's how it is, no? And, and and a lot of the things that we eat right now are rich and they are addictive. That's different. It's yeah. not doesn't mean that they are good. Like 
there is really good chips and potato chips in the market, but you eat them because they are addictive, not because they are extremely good. Yeah. Uh, my grandma or my grandpa used to fry the, 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 the bone yeah. of the fish, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it gives a tasty salt that the chips will never have it, and you eat it as a as an aperitive thing, you eat together mm-hmm. with a vermut, and you, like, in some parts of parts of Spain they call it raspa, and and that's incredible, and that's literally out of of, of meat. Like yeah. you, you need to use the fish until the point of like using the bones of, of right. the yeah, animal, yeah. but that's exactly the same as cooking bone marrow. That's out of the need that you that you start eating the inside of a bone. Yeah. And bone marrow, it's incredible. It's taste incredible. Well. And you can now go to a Michelin star, star restaurant and order. And they will put your bone marrow as the most sophisticated thing in the exactly. world. But that's because most of these things were discovered by someone who was hungry. Yeah. And so, and, and I, I really think, and this is why I think you know, there's a place for all of this. I, I, I do enjoy um, uh, gastronomy. I, I, re- I do enjoy mm. it for also the visual and the the sensual aspect to it. It's a weird way to say it, but I, I often liken it to a, an artist um, working on his or her craft. Um, but it's a very different um, art craft than when you're in uh, in Nepal. This is the bit of the police that I'm really interested in. When you go to a certain part, I discover this this this. Gosh, the, this is very embarrassing because I don't know what this dish is called. Uh, it's, it uses the, the uh, intestines uh, and it's covered, with, uh, but what's in it is bone marrow, I believe. Uh, so not noble parts of, a, mm. of an animal. And I don't even know what animals use. I think it's a lamb. I don't really like, I don't, I don't know. This is why you can see I'm getting interested, but I don't have the knowledge, right? So this, this is an exciting place to be. Um, and I tried it and my first reaction was, this is very interesting. Second reaction was, why do people eat this? Because the initial, it's, it's strong. And then as you have it um, with, a, with some beer and you have that you know, amongst friends, then you, I started loving it uh, also for, uh, because there, there's, there's a certain part of, and I can't even tell you which subculture in Nepal this comes mm-hmm. from, and I wish I'd researched this, but I, I'm just saying, speaking from, from memory. Um, it allows you to sort of connect to food that people are eating and and uh, and they're so proud to show you that this is their food yeah. uh, and it's a way to connect to, to people and uh, and so this is the bit that I'm really I I'm, I'm so I told you there's a familial side that's different but I, I'm also interested in sort of figuring out what the or discovering street food in Nepal mm. for that exact exact same reason yeah makes sense talking about street food actually also like we talk about it like before here in Berlin, there is like street food from absolutely Coconut everywhere everywhere. in the yeah. world, but not too much of traditional German food at the end. Nope. It's, is it a, a reflection of the, like the, 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 the situation of the city in the sense of like experts don't want to eat German food or it's due to the fact that German food doesn't have quality to, to or like I'm not I'm not saying that there is not good German food I'm just saying I'm questioning if it's if if the fact that there is three Vietnamese in one single street right in the non touristic <laughs> area of Berlin it's just a reflection that even the Germans prefer to grab a quick beer uh, it for than uh, trying to go for I don't know for yeah. <laughs> sauerkraut yeah no that's a fair point I think um so Berlin's never really been too good about um, German food, and a lot of German food tends to be, in my opinion, um, very hearty, sort of mm. more um, filling and yeah, more filling. And and I I love German food traditions, and and you you've spent some time in Hessen, so you know about um, Hanke's mit mit Musik and all yeah, that. Corn yeah. Sauce, yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. And so there is sort of a lot of originality in that. I think I, um, I, I enjoy that greatly. But certainly, apart from the currywurst, which is a, Ger- it's a Berlin sort of um, uh, dish, um, they aren't... Using Indian spices. <laughs> yeah, using, using, uh, using Indian spices. Um, and also a very simplified version, of, I imagine, mm. of Indian spices. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think Berlin, uh, the, the strength of Berlin is you can find food from anywhere in the world, any niche that you can imagine. 
Uh, like for example, if you want ne- Nepalese momo, this mm-hmm. is brilliant. If you want Nepalese momo, you can. There's a momo stall because momo traditionally is sold from little sort of stalls on the street, um, and they're they're made in mass quantities. Then it's not very expensive. It's anyone can afford it, mm. and it's in Kathmandu. You can you'll find one in every 50 meters. I'm exaggerating, but only slightly. So in Warsaw Straße, not very far from here, there's a little stall, and you can find momo that is 80%. Authentic to what you would find in Kathmandu, for similar prices, if I'm completely honest, uh, and it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, this is just almost street food level um, Kathmandu street food levels food you're getting in the middle of Berlin. That's the crazy thing about Berlin. It's just insane. Like, why? But do you think there was a kitchen like cuisine? And I'm, now I'm just trying to do the little bit like with the comparison that I know. No, for yeah. example, like. Barcelona, we we are arriving to a point where tourism it's taking the city. Okay, I in that sense, it is difficult. Like there is, of course, places that they are doing Catalan dishes. Yeah, but there is a lot of places that are not doing Catalan cuisine, and because we are losing, I mean, Italian restaurants have always been there. That's not a big deal. But every time we are having more, like I don't know. Um, Fast food also, where right. you find panadas from Argentina, uh, piadinas entering from there, uh, these or whatever, and the Catalan cuisine, which is rich yes, enough yes. to have their, their, their culture in there, it's reduced to very top notch restaurants, I see. which do interpretations of this cuisine. I don't, see. They don't even do like real, like traditional. I, I, right now, like, I don't really know where to have an escudella in Barcelona. Example. What is that? It's a broth made with uh, with vegetables and part of, of, of bone of the chicken or okay, whatever. Like it's a That's very strange. traditional. It was assumed to the to the to the. It's called the, the Christmas of Barcelona, and we do it with this big um, pasta in Christmas. But oh, I gotta try this. Um, now there is a person doing street food of Escudella. I don't know where he is based, but as if it was like the Catalan version of ramen. <laughs> and That's I great. find it incredible. I find it really nice, the idea, if the prices would reflect uh-huh. the Mascorella cost. I see. If it wouldn't be a, a thematic approach to sell Catalan tradition to tourists, yeah. and only to tourists. Yeah, 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 if you yeah. would be doing Catalan dishes for the people who are still living in Barcelona, which is not a lot of people, Yeah. But I think this is happening also here in Berlin. There is very few Berliners living in Berlin, like yeah, uh, yeah. at least in the in the center areas of Berlin. You, everyone lives in the in the outside, and I don't really know. And I am always have been curious about it. Like there is a traditional Berliner kitchen, around, yeah, or not, or it is well, like I mean, really I, reduced I, to to the currywurst that we were saying. No, no? but currywurst is very much. I, I would. It's not something that people eat very often. It's a snack, isn't it? Exactly. Like, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's like an eat a uh, eat to go day that you have three meetings in between and then you squeeze yeah. 20 minutes. Or, or to eat often, a uh, you know, yeah. you, you went out drinking and you you, exactly. you have it like just like kebab. Um, there are sort of DDR restaurants. Did you, the 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 uh, German Democratic Republic, so or the the East German. East Germany. Uh, had its own traditional sort of culinary traditions that were based on a bit of like Soviet or influence, Polish, yeah, yeah, Polish influence, and and um, there are restaurants that that do that and, and are very affordable still, and it's always an experience. Uh, I wouldn't say the food is it's not elegant food, but there is history in there, and mm. I always enjoy going to that sort of restaurants. Um, and or you can also go to uh, very near from here in Bezarinplatz. There's um, sort of Kitchen for Yedeman uh, or Kitchen for Yedeman. So it's for um, canteen, traditionally for workers, I imagine. But anyone can go, and the prices are very, very reasonable. Okay. And you get traditional German food. Um, and uh, shockingly, I've not been there yet, um, almost because I'm, in, I'm intimidated to go. <laughs> um, but I do, I do intend on going there. And those sort of places still exist. Um, and and the beauty is, it's open to everybody. In Barcelona and in Catalonia and. Spain in general still exists the menu of the midday, like the, the three dishes thingy for 10 euros. But it's not eight to 10 euros anymore. Now it's 15, 16, uh, it's, it's 18, a bit prohibitive you know, like it's just then. like, it's really overpriced for, for the service mm. that, that, that 
uh, it, they are paying people in Spain like right now. It's crazy. It's, it's I don't know. It is still the tradition of uh, cooking of whatever, but that's guerrilla cooking that we say a little bit. Not in the sense of like you fry a chicken quick and uh, and it's what you need. It's need to be like this because these people need to eat fast because yeah, they yeah, have thirty yeah. minutes break in between. That's nice, they, yeah. they fitting a three courses menu into a thirty minutes break. You cannot be cooking a reduction of risotto or whatever. <laughs> you know, like it's it's what it is. You're not doing. Yeah, you're not doing uh, like. Fancy sources, but yeah, I think it's it's getting lost in that sense. Too. So and you, and you lament that loss, um, clearly. definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not not only the the fact of losing like the, the Catalan traditional or Catalan or everything. I'm I'm pretty sure that there is like places in Madrid that are suffering the same thing or in, right. in, in Bilbao or whatever it is that we have a bigger problem. Like I think Barcelona and Madrid. Madrid is still a bigger city than Barcelona and it sends Barcelona it's becoming uh, impossible to live salary prices uh, restaurants etc etc at the same point that it's uh, it's like when you have three times the tourism every day that, that yeah. people living in there you are having a model of city that it's only for tourists so you are losing this kind of yeah. traditional thing so I will I will say that one of the the, um, the cool things about Berlin is Sure, inflation has uh, caused prices to, 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 to rise. Nevertheless, it remains still, to this day, um, quite an affordable city. Uh, getting a, an apartment is insane, don't even try. But, but if you are able to find uh, your, your, your space in Berlin, uh, you can still live comfortably without paying a whole lot of money. And it's still like, more expensive than before. But compared to any other European capital, um, to the west and to the south, uh, well, to the south depends. I think you need lovely, amazing things in Genova for very, very little money. But uh, it is, you know, in a city like Berlin, yeah, it's Genova, too, it's not a European capital. It's not a try, European capital. Try to find a flat in Rome. Uh, try to fly, find a flat in Rome. Yeah, no, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, just uh, one, of the, one of my biggest disappointments, and this is, um, I don't know why this affected me so much. There was, this was a period when I was missing France so much. And um, I was watching, you know, there's a show called uh, 10%. It's uh, called Call My Agent, I think, in Netflix. Mm. I was watching that and uh, it really made me miss France. That was my sort of way to try to think about my... When you're missing things, you try to consume things that are from your, your home. So I was consuming a lot of French things. And my flatmate, um, you know, in a lovely gesture said, let's go to a French restaurant. And we were three, three people. We went to the, the restaurant, um, a restaurant quite close to where we are right now. And I saw on the menu uh, coco vin. Mm -hmm. yeah? Classic coco vin is a chicken that is slow cooked, so braised um, with red wine traditionally, with lots of onions and you know, small vegetables. Uh, and it's delicious. So I ordered it. And I noticed before I, before I ordered it that it was with white wine. There is a white wine variation that you can do. And I thought, oh, this is interesting. It's a, it's a slightly sort of a chef's interpretation. And, uh, and it, was, it was not cheap. It was more than what I would ever pay for coupe vin in France. Because French food tends to be, for some reason, very expensive. But I thought, you know, I'm, I'm missing it a lot. And it's a sort of a special restaurant and ordered it. And what came was, uh, I've never been as disappointed, I think, in, in what I've ordered. It was white wine sauce that was sort of was a reduction uh, it was a, a braised sauce but the chicken was just simply sort of roast of yeah roasted chicken very dry on top of it it's not braised at all and to me charging that much for a coco vin that is not even does not respect oh, the first two not, rules yeah. yeah of coco vin um it's uh i was so disappointed mm -hmm. um and the, the amount of money we paid for that uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm sure they have other dishes and, and I won't mention the name of the restaurant, which is called Chez Maurice, but you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, it was quite a shame. Everything else was very good though, but the coco vin was, um, a disappointment. It happens. Well, arriving to this point, cooking for yourself. Yeah. Cooking for others. Yeah. Or getting cooked like, uh. Uh, yeah. I let anyone else cooking for me. I, I think I appreciate all of those things, but uh, my favorite thing to do is to cook for other people. 
Mm. That's that. I, I love that. But to do that, I have to try multiple times. So if I have a recipe in mind, I'll try two or three times oh, yeah. uh, on myself. Always. I don't. I'm, think I'm, 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 I'm a risky chef, like in that sense. Like yeah. I, I throw recipes that I've never done. On, on yeah. Guests, no, so. I, I don't think I've ever uh, given something to a guest that I'm not. Maybe and now I'm, nobody will want to come to my place. But yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> First of all, make sure that he invites you first, and then yeah. Um, he, uh, for the record, he's not invited me yet. But in his defense, he is in. Athens. You haven't been <laughs> to where I live ever. Like what the fuck? And that's also a fair point. Um, so yes, I think for cooking for other people, that's that's that. I love that. Mm. Yeah, always. In that cooking part, and it's something that I missed to ask before. Cooking what you cook, which is not from the region that you are. Might yeah. be difficult for certain ingredients for certain kind of things. One of the things that was difficult for me, for example, here was fish in, in yeah. Germany. I was in Frankfurt. I, I don't know if the offer here, but where do you buy here in, in in Berlin? So for fish, particularly in Berlin, since there's a lot of lakes in the area, if you're uh, going for so river fish, this is very easy. It's quite That's good. My problem. <laughs> That's you. Know, you want uh, the I sea, want the, of, yeah. yeah. Okay, saltwater fish. Uh, that's harder. In uh, but to be fair, the, some of the best fish is frozen. Uh, and and last time I said this, someone, uh, people were like, uh, I'm gonna get you know a scratch, um, because you know if, if good fro frozen fish, that's uh, tiefkühlfrozen, right? Like so deep mm -hmm. frozen. If it's right directly after it's been caught, that's the best way to transport fish, unless you're right next to the the the, the source. Uh, so. Unless your family comes from fishermen. Yeah. Unless, un well, yes, exactly. Well, for you, your level of your standards are, are yeah, quite Yeah, of high. course, that's the problem. That it's just like, it's yeah. difficult. It's yeah. difficult. Yeah. Mm. So for my um, Italian needs, there's Centro Italia. Uh, if I'm cooking a proper, like a very sort of slightly complicated meal, I go to Fish Paradise, but it's too expensive. Vegetables? Oh, <laughs> In, in Paris. And I'm, and I'm not blaming the Germans into this. No. Like everything that arrives here is from the south of Spain. So it's, it's, like, it's the weather. It's the weather. It's also the climate, you know. It's, uh, it's there's what it is. But actually, right now, like, it's ridiculous that, I mean, of course, like, if you go to, to Basque Country or to Madrid in winter, uh, the weather is what it is. Like, uh, the, the, yeah. the, the, the tomatoes that you will have in there yeah. are literally from Huerta down, or if you have uh, your fruit shop and vegetable shop of confidence, they will have better quality. But if you go to the supermarket and grab right. the first tomato that you find there, it will be exactly the same tomato that you will find Absolutely. here in any supermarket. Yeah, so the tomatoes here come from uh, Spain and Morocco uh, and from Belgium for some reason. Um, so, uh, no, I mean, so, you know, one of the things I miss uh, about France and uh, Paris is also that, um, like, there are streets on there where you have uh, the primeur, the vegetable sellers, the fishmongers, the cheese store, uh, these and these are separate. You know, the the cava, the cava van, the caviste, uh, and all of these things where you can go and buy certain things. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I didn't really always go to the primeur for the vegetables. I more often than not go go to the supermarket anyway. And um, it's a difficult concept. I mean, I, I'm I'm extremely in favor of small shops instead of like big brands and especially like supermarkets who are providing from that. But yeah. Willingly or not, you are passing through the supermarket for certain products because even if you are in the most decentralized country, Greece it would be an example of that. Like all the small shops are still surviving. Like I don't yeah, know when's yeah. the last time that you saw a shop of uh, small buttons of handle doors. <laughs> in Greece, there is thousands of them yeah, because yeah, yeah. they survive because their clientele is still loyal to them 100%. Still loyal. That's that's really yeah. And that's beautiful, but at the same time, you don't have a provider of cleaning products. <laughs> you can't just... No? Like, <laughs> at the end, you would need to pass to the supermarket for other kind of products. You do, and I mean, then you buy other things in the supermarket that are not there. But quality of it yeah no no it's it's i mean and, and also i do, i mean i we are living in inflationary times and i i also take certain pleasure in going to the supermarket like i go to my local etika and i, I really enjoy etika has good quality oh, etika has some, some some we even have a like, fresh um etika is not paying for this promotion <laughs> etika is not paying they really should be i love etika um and no but to go back to the uh you know in, 
the image of going to is like a small vegetable store, there's a good chance that the, the products that come there, in, in Paris at least, most of the f- fresh produce goes through Rangis. Mm. Uh, and there's a good chance you're getting pretty much the same, it, they come from the same, it comes from Rangis. Mm. But uh, the selection is often different because in Rangis you can go from, you know, sort of zero to, to hundred. Um, uh, I mean, I'm exaggerating again. But um, yeah, so I do, but I miss, like I said, um, if I'm doing apéro with my friends, I like to go to, there's a, uh, one of my friends lives in the Marais and there's a street called uh, Rue Bretagne. And there's a, uh, there's a particular shop I go for cheese. Uh, there's an Italian trattoria who ripped me off recently because I ended up, <laughs> I ended up getting uh, uh, two cheeses when I was, I try to speak in Italian and sometimes I get overexcited and I uh, don't listen to what I'm saying and I end up ordering more than I actually need. And then I don't correct myself because um, because yeah. why not? Two kilos of cheese, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Two cheeses is not bad. And um, anyway, so there's, there's all these lovely stores. If we're doing a napéro at my friend's place, we go to all these lovely little places and, and I, I like that. And I, it's not necessarily the products, the products are also very important, but the ritual, which of course has no inherent value, but has, mm-hmm. a, has a sort of uh, experiential or aspirational value. And a community value. At the end community also. value, yeah. And, and that means something to me, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I hope at some point this will go back and I, it's, yeah, I'm definitely, it's something that I will miss from, from Greece, 100%. Like the, When you move to Italy. <laughs> yeah, but Italy also, like, Greece, it's, it's still in this time, like in the sense of like, you still have every, every day you're marketing every different neighbor with the vegetables, with the farmers coming yeah, yeah, directly yeah. to there and you're shopping from the farmers directly very small shops and this in certain parts of Italy might be like that and you will need to know who is the producer and everything but but it's it's remarkable from the Greeks still to maintain this kind of like oh, I need to visit I'm not saying that the Greek cuisine is the most creative in the world because it's not it's rather like the Italian they, they go basic and they go simple and whatever they toast and roast and burn the meat a little bit too much for my taste but besides that i mean you eat really good really good prices and and it happens a phenomena that tavernas or restaurants are cheaper than supermarkets and that's that's why there is still a lot of culture of like going every single meal to go out whatever because if you try to reproduce what you order in the taverna it will you it will cost, cost you, you the so double. much Speaking so. of food, see, for him, I guess, I suppose I am becoming the food because look, look at that, look at that. <laughs> You're not meant to eat me. <laughs> look at that. Well, I suppose we all appreciate a bit yeah, of, of love. <laughs> well, I, this is very tough love as far as love goes. Okay, well. Well, I think the last question, just to close, we are finishing our wines and closing the episode with a wine question. Oh, lovely. Red or wine, wines? Oh, oh, I mean, yeah, oh gosh. Or when, what? Yes, okay, I think that's a, um, yeah. So gen- gen- generally I prefer uh, drinking uh, red, but it depends a lot on uh, the weather, the, the environment, even the lighting, right? Uh, if it's a sort of low-key lighting, you want red, obviously. Um, so for me, if it's white, um, I, I prefer things that are very, um, mineral, very dry. So typically with say oysters, I prefer mm-hmm. like muscadet. It's very classic. I'm not inventing anything here or a very, very dry, like a Chablis. Yeah, I do enjoy those or, or Chardonnay is a classic. Yeah. From Bourgogne and Burgundy. If it's a red, I, my natural tendencies go towards, um, deeper sort of full bodied, um, wines like with, with Syrah, Beauvais, so from the South of uh, France could also be from Italy. Um, so that are more spicy, more, uh, sort of peppery or, um, I'm translating from French. Uh, it's, uh, um, boise, uh, charpente, uh, wood, woods like, wood like, yeah. But then there's also, sometimes I enjoy, uh, vin de maceration. So uh, orange wine, right? So a white wine, um, that has been treated like a, yeah. Uh, red, red wine, wine, so their skin, there's some skin contacts. That sounds weird <laughs> in English, but uh, I, I do enjoy that. Uh, but more for apéro before the dinner. Uh, and in terms, as far as bubbles go, um, I'm a big fan of Cremant. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so from the Loire, there's lo lo lovely minerality from the Loire region, or obviously from Alsace. And I promise you, I did not pre-prepare that, that, that sentence. I, I genuinely, these are the wines I like the most. What about you? Oof. It's difficult. I mean, I've lived, I was raised in a world of reds, let's say like this. <laughs> and move to world of whites completely oh. because at the end here in germany and especially uh, when you move to the to the rhine and the rhine the region, muscle, yeah. muscle area and everything the predominancy it's it's the white wines um if i if i need to choose from here i'm, I'm also going more to the dry sense of it or sometimes sweet White wines are, are okay. Yeah. But for me, it's more like an association of white wines during the day or like the yeah yeah with the, the sun. The thing, and out, yeah. It's like a little bit more summerish vibe into it. Let's say like this. And I, I really like a, a, a variety. which is called a Gewürztraminer. Oh, um, uh, Gewürztraminer. Also in Alsace, we have that. Yeah. And um, I mean, I enjoy a good red, but yeah. Lately, also in 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 Greece, it, the white wine quality is better than the red wine, generically. Okay. So, but if you are going to try any Greek uh, uh, wines soon, I would definitely go for, for a region that it's called Nemea. It's the oh, yes, and that's of, the uh, only one I've heard of. It's beginning of Peloponnese. Actually, we okay. were there like a couple of weeks ago. We, we buy 20 bottles of 20. wine. Well, that's what you do. I mean, we went to producers directly and that's where you kind of try the wines and it was really really good experience and we tried actually a capustamina from Greece and <laughs> that's very new to me yeah okay. a, a crazy thing because at the end of course the soil is different the, the, the region is different so it, it was very 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 dry variation of the of what you would yeah. expect of, of a capustamina mm. and Really, really good quality from a from a producer called Barafakas. Uh, oh, there you go. In, in the so this is his <laughs> turn to his turn to plug producers. Uh, but yeah, really, really nice. Yeah. No, and also I've got to say, like in my answer, there's there's an inherent bias for French wines, and that's what happens if you're French. That you tend to focus on French wines, and one of the things I learned after coming to Berlin was, you know, I discovered Slovenian wine, Austrian wine, and I mean, I have my Hungarian. favorites, Catalan wines and Spanish wines, of course, yeah. but it's not something that I can access easily right now. Like yeah, I, I've been yeah, seven years outside of my, of my hometown. So at the end, I'm just like drinking that when I go to visit my parents. No, obviously, yeah. No, but this, the, the whole sort of, if you have Catalan wine, I'm sure is such a huge rabbit hole in itself. Uh, and so for me, you know, I'm, I'm right now working through sort of a long dog, a mm -hmm. and I'm starting to enjoy Bordeaux, which is why we're drinking Bordeaux. I didn't used to enjoy Bordeaux or wasn't, wasn't yeah it didn't appeal to me too much until i visited uh, a chateau in the grave area and um now i'm just so there's so many other regions so we tend to focus on that uh and then everything else i'm just sort of uh, i'm happy to have happy to have someone explain it to me but perhaps i i, I cannot uh really gain a lot of knowledge mm. on that yet i need to build up my knowledge about uh, french and maybe northern italian, italian wines and that's the focus for now yes so to close the episode favorite dish oh. favorite dessert and favorite wine yeah so this is going to be very sort of in the now right of course of course like yeah yeah everything is in the now in this yeah. episode like everything is in the probably now. in four years uh, your recipes are already in your website. There is Napoli's food in there, and you already explore different things. <laughs> no, you're yeah okay. So if if we're talking about in the now, I'll I'll do uh, an entree plat dessert and a wine. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. So this is very much now. This is not my all-time favorite. I would start with a very simple dish, which is uh, les oeufs mayonnaise or of mayonnaise. Yeah. Uh, which is just, it's a very simple dish with eggs and mayonnaise. It's, uh, it's simple, but I love it. It's very, uh, as it's, I love this word in French, we call it uh, regressive, regressive food. Okay. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm sure this exists in other languages too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, les, uh, les oeufs mayonnaise uh, for the, the starter. Mm -hmm. For the dish, now, this is very sort of hard to pick one simple thing. 
But if I absolutely had to, I would pick uh, in the French approach, because in Italy you have primo secondo, but let's forget that. It would be my signature dish, which is the risotto basquez. Mm -hmm. Simple to make and it's hearty. It's got a lot of um, sort of the warmth of the warmth of southern food um, and it's got risotto. I love the texture of risotto. Mm -hmm. Got that. Now, dessert, I'm not very dessert. But what I, what I would do is I would replace the dessert. And I do this quite often in restaurants. If other people are taking dessert, I order a digestif. A digestif. Oh, we missed the whole digestif part. Yeah, that's why I brought it back. So I would order a digestif instead of a uh, dessert. Although I do, in the, uh, there are some desserts I really enjoy, but I'm not really a dessert person. So I would get a digestif. And this would either be, uh, if I'm somewhere from traveling, it has to be a local thing from mm -hmm. that region. So digestif is essentially... Um, liqueur, liqueurice. Liquor, yeah. yeah. Like a uh, vegetable, often fruit. Thingy. Yeah. Like in, if I go to Denmark, it's uh, equavit. Mm. If I'm if I'm going to uh, France, it could be something like a cognac, a armagnac, uh, uh, chartreuse, limoncello, a limoncello, um, averna, that sort of thing. So that, so I, I I love this, and so that would be my entrée plat and dessert. Wine. Oh, sorry, wine. Yes. Um, well, you can say wine region if you if it covers better. Long duck. It would be a red from Long Duck. It's not, I know it's not very exciting. Uh, and people listening are probably going, uh, you know, yeah, it's really Long Duck is very common region. I, I love, you know, like um, a Pissant Lou or a, or, a, or a very basic Long Duck with, you know, the classic Syrah, Mauvais, Grenache, saint so that sort of, in some mix, right? I'm just, you know, it's, it's, it's like my home, you know, if music, you've got like the tonic of a, of a scale and that home note for me is the, the red Long Duck. So I'll go for that. Nice. Yeah. Thank you so much, Parima, for, for accepting a second episode, uh, second doing it in, in your place uh, yeah. in Berlin. Thank you so much for having um, me again. I'm excited that we did this one uh, finally in person and, and in not person. Uh, online. I'm trying to, to reduce the episodes online, but but yeah, thank you so much for, for the invitation and for accepting for, uh, the joining yeah. us. Thank you so much for listening to me because as some people might know, I'm not never going to say no to be to, you know, talking. <laughs> I, it comes quite naturally to me. So thank you so much. And um, congratulations on the rebranding recently. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, you asked me for some uh, advice about the colors, and I'm glad you went for the color I picked. So I'm very, very happy with that. You would be surprised, but you are not the only one who said okay. that one. Like literally like an 80% of the people was going for that color. So at the end, I, I thought it. Yeah. Why not? No. Well, it's, it's a lovely color, and, and so it's very exciting. Thanks to all your listeners as well, exactly. and um, do tell um, your friends about this uh, this podcast. Yeah, thank you a lot to all of you who are listening. Thank you, Ambulance from Berlin, uh, for destroying this outro. <laughs> uh, and yeah, as and always, don't don't forget to subscribe to the channels and, and follow us, and yeah, check part of our websites and, and social media also. I'm sure it'll be on the notes. Maybe you will learn some recipes. Uh, hopefully, I, I've not gotten around to that, but I do. Hope it will to do that arrive. It will arrive. Yes. Thank Have you a, so much. Thank you so much as well. Bye. Yeah.